this journey. Um, that map is actually on a bin on the train, so that's a very aesthetic bin. And I'm here on a research trip at the Robert Schumann House. Um, Zv Zvika was his birthplace, so this is why the most important collections and archives are here. And it's also the host of many important documents and portraits and manuscripts related to Clara Schumann. So today I'll be playing her sonata on a piano that was built by one of her cousins, Wieck. And this should have been from around the 1860s, I think. And this is just showing you um, the Viennese, English and French piano mechanisms at the time. As you can see, they are really, really different. This should be the Viennese at the top. It's lighter, quicker. This is the English. the English. And this is the French. And this should be the French. This is me very awkwardly getting on the chair, which at this point I didn't realise actually I could shift it a little bit closer. I was trying not to step on the pedals. Um, and this is just me running through the sonata. There's a fair bit of trial and error. Um, the, a car alarm on the street outside went off halfway through, so there's a lot of gaps. Um, um, there was this nice man who was also visiting this exhibition, so I was just careful to play around that. So it's not a seamless recording, but I had a lot of fun. And yeah, and I just, throughout the whole time I was thinking, what if she had premiered and published this piece? Maybe this is what it would have sounded like on this piano, just a couple of decades later. So here's the first movement. <laughs>
So, a whole seven minutes into this, and I'm thinking now that I'm going to fall off or get a real backache playing like this, and I realised actually you can push this forward. Um, so it's sort of been, it's not supposed to be like that, so the pedal is an extra device that you can add underneath, and the point is that then you can play the piano as if you're playing an organ, and you could be playing some notes with your feet. Um, I do not have the coordination or the training to do that, but it was kind of interesting. I did play around, but I didn't record that part. Um, and just interrupting this musical bit with the original manuscript of the sonata. And this was written over the Christmas and New Year of 1841-42. to That's her dedication to Robert Schumann. Um, So this is the first movement, which she wrote first with the third movement, and then she wrote the second and the fourth movements together. And this is just a close-up of my favourite bit, which is the development section of the first movement, which happens to quote one of her own songs called uh, He Came in Storm and Rain. I'll just put the German title in the caption as well. And here's the second movement.
already knew from research, but it was very interesting to see it in real life, which is that she'd written the first and third movements in one shot, and then the second and fourth movements slightly later. So I think the first and third, probably around Christmas, the second and fourth um, in the new year, which would make sense because the second movement actually quotes um, Schlummerlied by Robert Schumann, and that was his Christmas gift for her after the birth of their first child, Marie.
So this recording has turned out a lot better than I expected actually, I didn't really know what to expect. It's very hard to tell um, when you're sat at the piano because you're not hearing what you know people would be hearing at the other end of the space and it's doubly hard when you're on a historical instrument um, because everything just feels so different. But not in a bad way, actually. My two main takeaways from this were really, really pleasant surprises. And the first was a great surprise, just how much easier it was to maintain clarity in the more dense textures in this piece. Um, even though I was not doing anything to the pedal consciously, I was just sort of pedaling by instinct. I wasn't really thinking about it. I sort of adjusted my touch um, again, by sort of intuition, I didn't, wasn't analysing what I was doing as I went along because that was not the point um, of this experience anyway. And it just surprised me that the soprano line can really sing and you get a lot of resonance from the bass and not much, I'm not doing anything special with the pedalling and it's still clear enough, I think. Um, but also not too dry. It's definitely, definitely not fragile, this instrument. It's really robust, um, which is amazing. It's been kept in great playing condition. I was told that all three grand pianos in the Schumann Houses Vicar are still used every year for concerts, so they really keep it in, in top condition. But of the three pianos there, this was the one that I found the easiest to play on. Um, I didn't really feel like I had to adapt to it so much. I think it's just, um, it probably shares a lot of similarities to the modern grand piano that we play on. But at the same time, the color is slightly different. Um, the keys are not as heavy. The action's not as heavy. It is very responsive. Once you get used to it, you can do there's so many colours that you can do with it, um, and it's definitely still powerful. I think sometimes we underestimate how powerful these 19th century instruments can be, even though it predates, uh, you know, like the late Russian romantics like Mature Brahms or, um, you know, Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky and so on, uh, but there is so much power and so much variety that you can get. Yeah, um, whether this will make such a difference to how I play the sonata in the future, I'm not so sure. I think I think I've reached a point um, in my relationship with this work and just in my performance experience in general that I don't think playing in a way that is historically uh, informed, not not saying that we don't want to be informed, but it's not really the goal to play in a way where you're like trying to imitate the sound of the past, because that's not the point. Um, but it is nice to just have this tactile relationship with a piece of history and add it to the basket of options that you have when you're at the piano trying to find um, new ways of playing a piece that you already know really, really well. And I think that's the main takeaway. Yeah, it's kind of like, I wouldn't say it's traveling back in time, not really, because we're bringing our modern ears and modern understanding of piano history and piano repertoire. And then we're bringing it to a piano that's more than 150 years ago. But it's kind of like having a conversation with history. I'd say, yeah, and just seeing where that takes us.